The most important thing we have to start our conversation with when we talk about our ocean world is this amazing planet that we're on. <laughs> is this amazing thing that looks blue. There's lots, there are many unique things about our planet. You're one of them, right? That's my, that's my boost, make you, make you feel better, right? That's good. Um, but seen from far away, one of the most interesting things is this blueness, this waterness. And that is, that's really key for, for life, for a whole bunch of the issues that you and I are dealing with now in coastal management and, and on and on and on. So let's start off with this. Okay, what is this? Us. us, excellent. So that's us. Well, maybe not you, maybe some of you were born, but this is me during a, a, a chemistry test in, when I was an undergrad in college. What we're looking at here, yeah, I know, it's a great picture, I know. <laughs> what we're looking at here is one of the most amazing objects our species has ever created. This is Voyager 1. We had the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft that went to explore the outer planets of our solar system. And then once they, they did their due there, they, just, they left. They went on into outer space. And so they are the farthest human-made objects that we've ever created. And they're, they're on just a perpetual go-away-from-us course. These, these are the objects that you might have heard of with the famous gold plaques and the records, recordings of the Earth. You know, greetings of friendship from the people of the Earth, that kind of thing. So really cool. So when we're just about to lose uh, a data contact, we stayed in contact for a little while later, but we didn't, couldn't get as much high-quality data. When we're just about to lose the kind of data where we could take images. Basically, on a whim, the folks at NASA had the probe spin back around, spin 180, and look back and take a shot just for the heck of it. And just by random luck of the light, of the position of the Earth, of the position of Voyager, we got this picture. And this thing on the left is a blow-up of this. And this is what um, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, famous astronomer, uh, wrote about in his, his uh, almost last book called The Pale Blue Dot. I don't normally read long quotes to you guys, but I want to read this one because I think it's important. I think it sets the, the stage for us. So this, picture, um, so this picture is from 1990, and a couple years later, uh, uh, Sagan was given a, a, a lecture at Cornell, and um, he he showed these he showed these images, and we showed this image. This is what he said. He said <clears throat> we uh, talking about how they got the picture and everything, and then he said we succeeded in taking that picture from deep space, and if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who's ever lived lived out their lives, the aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother, every father, every inventor and every explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species, lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and in triumph they can become the momentary masters of a fraction of this dot. Think of all the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of the dot on scarcely distinguishable inhabitants from another corner of the dot. How frequent their mis misunderstandings, how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatred, our posturing, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in a great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all the vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. It's up to us. It's been said that astronomy is a humbling and I might add a character building experience. To my mind, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionate with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale 
blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So that pale blue dot that Dr. Sagan was talking about looks blue because of water. That's the most important thing you see from far away. You don't see the generals, you don't see the silly politicians, you don't see the, the noble deeds, you see the blue. Water is a really interesting thing. Water, we believe, is key to life, at least at life as we know it. And so our, our colleagues that, that study the natural world out in space have spent a lot of time trying to find water elsewhere. And, you know, a while ago we used to say, well, Earth is the only place we got water. No, we know there is water elsewhere now. So for example, this is uh, an image of a crater on Mars. This image was collected in 2005. And what we see here in the bottom of this crater, which is, is t this is false color uh, imagery, but we see at the bottom of the crater where the shadows are longest, where the sun penetrates the least, there actually is what we believe now is frozen water. This is, rel is a relatively small patch of water, right? This is, this is not you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles wide. This is, this is a small little dollop. We got additional evidence by some of our rovers that were going across, um, going across Mars. And in fact, some of them are still going across Mars. So in this case, uh, so we, we, we call a day on Mars a sol, a, a, a solar cycle. And so this is on day 24 <clears throat> of one of our uh, missions. And what you'll see on the left is a scoop. So these rovers typically are one of the main missions is to look for water, to look for compounds, look for the precursors of life. And so uh, in this case, what we've done is we've taken a little scoop, just like you would at the beach with a sand shovel, and we've, we've gone forward, we've taken a scoop out, and then uh, we have instruments we can scan it and take pictures. So the picture on the left was taken on day 20, or Sol 20, and then we took the same exact picture, the, the rover didn't move, took the same picture on day 24, and if you look closely, you'll notice, that's right. These crystals, in the, something in the surface, or something in the lower left corner, evaporated. We now think that was water, frozen water that evaporated. There's another spot you can see. It. That's right. Yeah, the, 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 right. There are more. Here's some time lapse um, from one of our aerial um, satellites on Mars. And what we're looking at here is a time series, and we're seeing evidence of erosion. Not entirely sure this is caused by water but the pro processes seem very similar to what we might have after a rainstorm, after a, an iceberg melts or something of that nature. So we see evidence that there's water or at least water-like compounds on uh, Mars. And the more we've looked, the more we've found it elsewhere. So here's Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn. This image was ca captured by Cassini. We just flew Cassini into Saturn a couple days ago and it, its mission has ended. It's 30 year mission of planning and everything. So a fantastic uh, example of, the, of uh, the power of great design and engineering and exploration. Um, but uh, when it was still working, we went and checked out various aspects of Saturn, the rings and this and that. One of the things we did was go to look at this moon called Enceladus. And uh, as, the, as Cassini was going around and looking back one day, it saw this. What you're looking at are ice volcanoes, are volcanoes that are blasting uh, other things too, methane and some other substances, but but included in there is water, frozen water shooting out into space. That was that was that evidence came through in 2005. A few years later, about a decade or so later, um, we actually started to get additional evidence that there might well be a liquid ocean, a, a polar polar ocean, um, on Enceladus, and at least one part of the, uh, of, the, of the liquid there is likely water. So we do have water elsewhere in the universe. Of course we do. We do have water elsewhere in our solar system. But nowhere is it like it is here on Earth. Right? We have some dollops here. We have some things over there. And this makes the astronomers really excited. They want to go explore these places. Maybe there's some precursors of life. That's one of the reasons we crashed Cassini into Saturn to burn it up, because we were afraid it might accidentally land in one of these areas and contaminate it with our DNA, with our signals of life that we didn't want to do. So this is your world. This is our world, our, our planet that has a world ocean. We like to talk about the different units of the ocean, but really it's one giant 
uh, by and large, one giant uh, contiguous chunk of water. So we don't always spend a huge amount of time memorizing things in this class. These are some factoids you should write down and you should know these, because these are, these are important. Um, I, I should say that with this and the next couple slides, the exact numbers, it, it, it's, you'd think it would be easy to measure the volume of the water on the Earth. It's, it's a little bit challenging. You have to pull together huge data sets and there's various things. So slightly different, you'll see slightly different numbers, slightly different percentages based on the approach that people have taken to measure this. But, but we'll use these for sake of having you know, some, some standardized language to speak of. Um, if we just talk about the two-dimensional surface, the, the skin of the ocean, it's huge. It's the dominant feature on the surface of the Earth. It covers about 71% of the surface area of our planet. It is on, our, our global ocean is on average deep. It's about three and three quarters kilometer deep on average. The deepest of the deep deep is the Challenger, so-called Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench, and that goes 11 kilometers down of water. Incredible punishing uh, uh, pressures and, 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 and craziness down there. Um, so the Marianas Trench is the, is the deepest point in the world's ocean. The vast amount of the water on planet Earth, the vast, 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 vast amount are, resides in this global ocean, is in this salty water liquid phase. So uh, about, about three and three quarters kilometer deep on average, about three degrees Celsius on average, just slightly above freezing. So most of this water ocean is cold. Our Earth is over four billion years old, so for the first several hundreds of millions of years, we, were, we think we were lava and various things like that. Um, but relatively rapidly in the history of our planet, the global ocean began to form. So, this, so an ocean has been in a, a continuous existence for over three billion years on our planet. This is really the cauldron of life. This is where, where things came from, where things evolved, where things developed, all the, the wonderful diversity that we see on Earth. This is literally our, our womb. The biggest feature on, uh, on planet Earth, if we just looked at it you know, purely from a geological standpoint, from a shape, from, from, a, from a geometry standpoint, that's going to be this ridge that extends around a huge amount of um, the ocean, this trans, uh, a transoceanic mountain range, basically. You don't know about it because it's underwater, so you can't see it but it exists there at the bottom of the ocean. The single largest mountain, the single largest uh, uh, elevation of rock from the surrounding surface is uh, Mauna Kea, is Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. Now, when you and I go to Hawaii, it looks big. We have observatories up there. We have, we have uh, there's, you can go snow, ski it in the winter time, and, well, I guess all year sometimes, but, but you know, in the cold times, there's snow up there. Crazy. So you and I look at it and go, this is a crazy tall mountain. But you and I are only seeing the part from the, air, from the, the, the ocean surface up into the air. So the part that you and I see is about four kilometers high. If you actually go from the tip of that all the way down to the bottom of the abyssal plain, it's more than 10 kilometers high, a massive, massive feature. So some aspects of our water planet are obvious, the, the percent cover, the, the percent <coughs> surface that is water. Other things are shrouded in this water cloak, and they're maybe not super obvious to us. Cool? Cool. All right. Uh, now, again, you've got to be careful with these numbers because everybody has slightly different numbers, but here's some numbers so I can at least give them to you. So this is a, br a rough distribution of water across planet Earth. Um, so this number differs a little bit different than that one I just gave you. I gave you like 96-ish, this one says 97. It, it's, it's somewhere in there, right? Um, but again, the vast majority is in the ocean in saltwater form. The next largest percentage, which is but a small fraction of the stuff in the ocean, is frozen water, is in the form of ice uh, in, in, in glaciers around Antarctica, et cetera. And then it's an order of magnitude. Uh, less 
the stuff that you and I can actually use. Be that groundwater, be that surface water just, just hanging out on the surface, either still or running, etc. So ocean, 96-97% of the water. Uh, locked up in ice, about 2%. Everything else is a fraction of, of a percent. So all this stuff that we're talking about, every single thing we're talking about today and in these subsequent lectures about physical oceanography, all have direct implications for different conservation, different management issues. In this case, one simple one might be uh, global warming, right? We talk about the air temperature, but well, the ocean is the real reservoir, thermal reservoir. We'll more about that in a second. Okay, good? All right. Bit of review here. Remember, we have three phases of water. So one of the unique things about our planet isn't that we, we have water, but it's the abundance of water, and it's the fact that we have, we, without doing any special magic, without going down in the middle of the core of the planet or something, we have at the same, you know, in, this, in the same space, we can have water in gaseous form, water in solid form, and water in liquid form. That's that's the really cool thing. The, the volume and then and then the diversity of states that our water exists here on Earth. Okay, so we have different phases of water. What determines the phase? The phase is determined by um, different uh, battles, uh, sort of different energy battles. The two things that are battling are the hydrogen bonds that are working to hold these water molecules together, and thermal or or, or kinetic energy. You know, heat is basically these molecules vibrating, 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 and so that vibration is trying to push the it acts to, in a sense, spread these molecules farther and farther from each other. The hydrogen bonds act to 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 suck these guys together. So there's this constant seesaw, uh, a constant battle as to what the form the water uh, will exist in. So we'll start with ice. Ice is obviously the solid form. It's the low temperature limit. Ice is where the, the energy from those hydrogen bonds greatly exceed the energy from the, the thermal, uh, from the kinetic uh, force. Ice uh, will turn water into a regular lattice structure. So here we go. This is a three-dimensional process, but it's kind of hard to show a three-dimensional process on my two-dimensional screen. So I'm just going to show it to you guys you know, simplified, but you guys should realize that this is really a three-dimensional thing. This is ice, okay? So it's regularized, it's, it's, it's a crystalline thing, and, and it's, it's uh, everybody's going on. And so, so those, little, those little dollops there, those are our, uh, our, our water molecules. We get liquid when we're at an intermediary temperature. We get liquid where the, the energy of the hydrogen bonding is about equal to the thermal uh, energy. And so what we get there is we get little kind of mini ice-like structures. We get these little mini clusters of, of hydrogen bonds, uh, you know, sort of bo bonding to these oxygens of, of the neighboring molecule, et cetera that are, again, more, more crystal-like, and then we have freely associated water that's kind of blurbling around in between those, those clusters. The third phase is obviously the gaseous phase. And so in this case, this is the high temperature, and here, the hydrogen bonds are, are way um, defeated by the strength of the kinetic energy. The thermal story is really what's ruling the day here. And here, we have essentially water molecules that are separated from each other. They're, they're vibrating, they're ping, 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 bouncing off each other, and they're basically not interacting very much with their, their fellow water molecules. Cool? Yeah. Are you with me? Okay, now, those things that we just described oh, turn into a lot of really cool emergent properties with water. So I want to talk about them now. Okay. The first is this notion of thermal inertia. Right? Remember inertia from our physics class? Inertia is the, the tendency of an object at motion to stay at motion, or the tendency of an object at rest to stay at rest. Right? It's, it's the, the ability to perpetuate the state you're in, continue the way you are. And so we can talk about thermal inertia as the broad topic. And, and then we have different terms depending on which state of water we're, we're talking about. We could talk about the heat capacity. 
Heat capacity is the amount of energy required to raise one, and this is a standardized, you know, STP standard uh, chemist terms, but this, to take uh, one gram of, to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Now the amazing thing is there's only one substance that we know of that has a higher heat capacity than water. Let me say that again. Don't sleep through this. That's crazy yeah. talk. There are gazillions, hundreds of, who knows, millions of compounds on planet Earth. Water has almost the highest heat capacity of everything that we know of. Right? It's not a mystery that you are mostly made of water. It's not a mystery that pigs are mostly water, that fish are mostly water. Right? This is a magical substance. And so, uh, so uh, ammonia actually has a higher substance. So sometimes you'll get certain different thermal pumps, heat pumps, and different uh, uh, energy plants that might use ammonia as their as their heat transfer mechanism. But, but by and large, water is fantastic. So this allows, amongst other things, a thermal buffering, and and help and leads us to having currents in the ocean. Really cool, really really cool. All because of the the basic property of of water. Latent heat effusion, same idea, but now instead of instead of uh, turning a um, uh, to raising the temperature of uh, liquid water, we're talking about the heat required to melt one gram of ice and turn that into liquid water. Same idea. Again, only ammonia has a higher latent heat effusion than water, and this also allows a lot of this thermal buffering that that we've talked about. We'll see some examples in a bit. Third example, latent heat of evaporation. And so this is where we take water, one gram of water, and turn that into uh, uh, one gram of um, uh, water vapor. And in terms of the latent heat of evaporation, water does have the highest uh, value uh, compared to the, all the substances that we, that we know about. Um, and again, helps uh, allows this, this thermal movement of energy around our world. So, okay, the ability to, to, to hold its temperature, we've got to put essentially a lot of energy in to get water to change temperature, to get it to change phase. Next thing would be thermal expansion. Totally bizarre. It's most dense before it freezes. So let me say that again. So water is most dense before it becomes solid, which seems kind of weird. But it, but it, it leads to a key property, yeah. and so this is why ice floats. Okay, uh, check this out. Check this out. So this is the manifestation of all that stuff we were just talking about. This is the manifestation of that thermal inertia. Why? What are we looking at? We're looking at a satellite, a composite satellite image of the surface of the Earth. We've removed the clouds, so you guys can see the clouds, or excuse me, so you don't see the clouds. Um, and then what we're showing you here is the, the change in. So this is not absolute temperature, this is difference, okay? So in other words, if the daytime and the, oh God, now my glasses are all salty. Okay, so <laughs> if the daytime and the nighttime were the same exact temperature, the difference would be zero. And that would be, that's illustrated here with the white, the white uh, color. Cool? As we diverge, as we go to either cooler colors or warmer, hotter colors, that's saying there, there's a, a much greater difference between the day versus night. And so what's the pattern you guys see? Water buffers temperature, right? So, so we see, this is not a map of continents. This is a heat map. But you see all the continents, right? They're totally manifest. Even Antarctica, even Antarctica with with its ice. with its ice and its glaciers, you can it still shows up as distinct from the ocean. So again, the goings on of land are different from the goings on in the ocean. And so what you guys are seeing is the bufferingness of the water. The water doesn't allow us to get crazy crazy hot. Doesn't allow us to get crazy crazy cold. What's the average temperature of the world's oceans? Three. 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 There you go. Good. So, but what it does say is on, but where we do get these huge swings, deserts, forests, right? We don't have the buffering. We have water vapor around us, but we don't have all that, 
that, that blanket of, of water enveloping us and making, making us stable. So the ocean is more, even though we'll, we'll see that there's structure to it, the ocean is more thermally stable than the air. Cool? Again, that's all about the properties of the hydrogen bonding, the kinetic energy, all that cool stuff. All right, let's go on some other cool properties of water. Other cool properties. So we just talked about the, the, the inertia, the thermal inertia. Another amazing, so if we just one of these things would be just crazy, totally crazy. But water has crazy upon crazy upon crazy. It's like my family, totally crazy. So, so here's dissolving power. Here's the here, here's an, an uh, it, it's it's one of the terms we use for water is the universal solvent. It doesn't dissolve everything on the planet, but it dissolves an amazing number of things. Again, one of the reasons why you have water is one of the main constituents of your body, right? We have all these, these salts and all these other, these electrolytes and all these things going around in our circulatory system. So water has an amazing power to dissolve a whole variety of things. As I said, the, the, the uh, common term for water is universal solvent. Um, Yeah, okay, so if we look over there on the right, my little, my little illustration here, what we're seeing is one of the ways that water does this. One of the main ways is having this, this strong ionic character, the strong polarity about the molecule. So we have um, a part of the molecule, the, the O, the oxygen, and then we have the hydrogen parts, and they, and they segregate from each other. So we tend to have a positive-sided part of the molecule and a negative-sided part of the molecule. And so for example, we put something like sodium chloride, which, which in air or in our hands or whatever is a, is a solid thing and all together and all, all stuck together, right? When you want to, when you try to shake, if you try to make some salt, you have to break it apart, separate it, physically separate those bonds. Um, unless you put an anti-caking agent in like most of us have in our table salt. Um, but, uh, but if we take that, we throw that in water, what immediately happens is these water molecules orient around the, the sodium and the chlorine, and they, they dissolve it. So instead of having a big solid lump of white in our liquid, it becomes clear because that, that sodium, that chloride is dissipated throughout, dissolved throughout the entire volume of that chunk of water. Um, right, okay, cool. Another amazing thing is transparency. Again, it's the reason you and I see in the what we call the so-called visual spectrum is because because of water, because of water. So water has a, a great ability to absorb, but also transmit electromagnetic radiation depending on the wavelength of that radiation. So, for example, heat, what we might call infrared radiation is absorbed readily by that water. So if we shoot some, some heat, if we put a heat lamp on one side of this water tank and we put a sensor on the other, we won't see a lot of heat coming through. If we, but visual light is, if I put a white light, if I put a flashlight on one side of this water tank, turn the light on, you, you'll see the light, you'll, you know, you're, you'll, it'll look bright on the other side. And then once we leave that spectrum, once we get into higher energy uh, radiation like the ultraviolet, that is not, that does not, uh, transmit through uh, water very far. What is water made out of? Water is made, oh, you guys know H2O, right? Okay. Um, but in seawater, the, the most important thing is the water, right? That we, we get that there, by, by volume, by bulk, by mass, water is the big story. But then we have a bunch of other cool things, and I've listed them here in, in, in order of, of abundance. So the next thing we have are so-called suspended materials. What's the difference between suspended materials, dissolved materials? Who the hell knows? Some scientists got together and they made an arbitrary cutoff. So if we throw a sand grain that you and I can see, throw a sand grain in the water, that is called suspended material. If it was this really, 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 really teeny tiny fine grain piece of sediment, we would call that d dissolved, right? And so it's, it's just a matter of how big the thing is. So just by convention, 
we say if something is bigger than about half a micron, that would be suspended material. Generally speaking, that's stuff that our, our naked eye could see or our naked eye with a little hand lens could see. And if the material is, is in the water but is, is too small to see, we call that dissolved material. In terms of the dissolved stuff, the major constituents are going to be the things that are familiar to you as chlorine, uh, sodium, uh, sulfate, magnesium, all these guys. Okay. Uh, have a look here. Have a look here. This is not a percent. Okay. You guys see this? This is so percent. Do you know who invented the percent sign? Anybody? What's that? Nope. <laughs> all right. Cut to the quick. Nope. Tell us. Okay. All right. Good. Good interaction. Okay. So, so. Uh, <laughs> Accountants. Everybody, everybody ever read Charles Dickens? Everybody read a Christmas Carol? The, what we call the clerk, what the crazy weird Brits like Dr. Steele call the Clark. Like, what the hell? There's no A, it's E, but they call it Clark, so it's, they're weird. But, but so those guys, those guys were transcribers. Those guys were Xerox machines and, and calculators before we had Xerox machines and calculators. So the British Empire, this big, huge trading empire, trading across the world, India, Americas, all over. These guys are in these cramped little tables day and night transcribing numbers. And they got tired of writing percentages. A number slash 100. So to save time, they did a zero slash zero for percent. In other words, they cut off the, the 10 from the 100 on the, on the, on the uh, denominator. Everybody with me? So all this is, is the same exact convention. It's just instead of per cent, instead of parts per 100, this is parts per thousand, right? So we'd, same thing, we've cut off the one and the zero, and we're left with, in this case, two zeros on the bottom. Cool? So for example, chlorine, I've listed as 19.2 parts per thousand. If we want to write that as parts Per hundred or, or percent, what would that percent be? 1.92. Good. Excellent. So in your notes, you guys can choose to write this symbol if you want. Or you can write, uh, uh, there's different ways to do it, but, but one of the most common ways, people just put the lowercase p, lowercase p, lowercase t for parts per thousand. Right? So, so there's a, there's a couple different ways you can do that. If, if you have a hard time finding that in your typewriter, you just put PPT, right? Parts per thousand. Everybody with me? Okay, let's go back here. So the major things, now I, I say here globally conservative because by and large, I mean, there are always some variances, but by and large, if we went to Japan and we went to California, these numbers would be pretty similar. Right? There's going to be a little bit of variance, but by and large, they're not going to waver a huge amount. So in, in ocean water, we're going to get about uh, 19 parts per thousand chlorine, about 11 parts per thousand sodium, and so forth. Okay? Uh, uh, sodium and chlorine are why when we taste salt water, it tastes salty to your, to your taste buds in your, on your tongue. All right. Then we get into the so-called minor and trace constituents, and these are things that are very... They're there, but they're, they're very small uh, concentrations. But the next one I want to flag for you guys that it has a management uh, implication would be the nutrients. Now, the nutrients vary widely, depending on where we are on the, on the Earth. Uh, so we have uh, various forms of nitrogen, uh, various forms of phosphate, and silicone. Those are, the, those are the, the three most important nutrients. Again, there are others, but those are the, those are the, big, the big daddies. Nitrogen, phosphorus, silicon. Then we actually have, this is crazy cool. This is crazy stuff. We have gas in the water. Fish do not break apart mo water molecules to breathe. Fish breathe air like you and I do. They're just sucking off these little teeny tiny pockets of gas, dissolved gas, out of the water to breathe. They're just really, really good at their physiology. They can, they can, they can find those little uh, clumps of dissolved gas in the water. And so uh, gases are also highly variable. And gases are really going to be influenced by 
uh, how deep, we, particularly how deep we are in the ocean. But uh, just to, to start off with, what I've shown you here is the per, is the gross percentage of these of these molecules in our atmosphere, and then as we hit the surface of the water, et cetera. So so um, in air, nitrogen is most of what you and I breathe in. Oxygen is the next most common thing, and then we get into carbon dioxide and other things. That that the the rank stays the same when we get in the water, but note that the concentrations are different. Check it out. Oxygen is relatively enriched in terms of the gaseous form of, of, of elements in the water relative to the air. Again, again, that, again that, that's not gross number of molecules, but that's relative to other gases. Would that explain why when it's the air? Ooh, excellent question. Maybe that has something to do with our little demo. Yes, maybe all that air in the water has something to do with the ice forming. Ooh, ooh, it's like a clue. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. Okay. Um, okay, and then we, then we have various organics, very, very, various carbon compounds of different forms, and those guys are highly variable. So these are the main things. Again, this, is, this isn't a marine bio or a fishy oceanography class, but you should know at a minimum for our coastal management issues that we, in, in seawater, we have water, suspended materials, sediment, things like that, broken pieces of wood, et cetera, dead whales. Then we have dissolved materials, and we have, and we have the major constituents that are globally conservative, that are pretty consistent wherever we go on the, uh, by and large, on the, uh, on the earth. Then we have some, some other constituents, some minor constituents. The nutrients that are really, really key for algal blooms, for, for, for photosynthetic organisms, stuff like that. We have gases that are really key, particularly the oxygen, for uh, uh, um, for aerobic respiration, for active movement of, of sharks and fish and things like that. And then we have various uh, uh, um, casting offs of things that were alive, different tissues and organic stuff. Cool? Questions? Okay, we're, we're getting close to the pausing point here. Okay, so then what we have is we have ocean salinity. All this stuff together, all this dissolved stuff comes together to make the ocean not, um, not fresh water. And we, we refer to that as salinity. So salinity is the amount of these inorganic dissolved salts that are in our chunk of water. Again, we're talking about the units here are typically parts per thousand by convention because because using uh, parts per hundred or percent, the stuff is so small, it's, it's, it was just conventionally easier for people to write whole numbers rather than fractions. So that's why we use parts per thousand for a lot of this. Here's another super important number. This could be on your first quiz, maybe. Okay, uh, the global, now there, there, there is a great variation in salinity depending on where we are, but if I just had to pick something, you want to say, if I ask you a question like, say, on the first quiz, what's the, what's a typical uh, salinity of ocean water? You want to say 35 parts per thousand. 35 parts per thousand. We have we have a whole okay, and so then with that 35 parts per thousand, that's 3.5 percent of this chunk of of this volume of seawater is going to be made up of salts. And the rest, the vast majority, 96.5% in this example, uh, is, is the water part. The reality is it varies a bit. Could be 34, could be 36, but 35 is, 34, 35 is a good, either of those is a good solid number. We, we get the extremes, and okay, so rainfall, evaporation, evaporation sucks water out, makes it saltier, rainfall adds more water in, makes the salts more dilute, so it's less saline. Um, and where we see the most consistent uh, differences in salinity gradients are near the sources where fresh water runs into our global ocean. And so that's going to be places like um, the mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, the mouth of the Santa Clara River, places like that. Um, some examples of, of some of the salinities of different areas, the Red Sea, is saltier than the ocean. It's in a it's in an arid area, so there's a lot of evaporation. So so there's more salts have accumulated there. Um, this one uh, 
area in Finland where we have a lot of, a lot of um, glaciers melting and a lot of constant inflow of fresh water. It's almost fresh water, even though you're in the, the ocean, quote unquote. The saltiest water body on Earth is the, is the so-called Dead Sea, and that's massively more salty than the typical ocean. Orders of magnitude more salty, 240 parts per thousand. How do we measure this? Uh, uh, we measure it a couple different ways. Um, typically, these days, we use electrical conductivity. So we take a little current, we, we put a little current through this water, and if it's, if it's pure fresh water, the electricity isn't going to, the electrons aren't going to move very easily through there. There's going to be a lot of resistance. If we have salt in there, the salt really helps the electrons run around. So the saltier it is, the, the easier it is for the, the electrical current to run through that. And so um, that, that's, that's the typical way we measure um, salinity these days. However, another very common way is with a refractometer. And I'll sh I don't know if I have it here today, but I'll show you guys next time um, how a refractometer works. This is super awesome. No batteries needed. If the end of the world comes, right, uh, and, and we don't have any more batteries, you can use a refractometer, no problem. Refractometer is awesome. You know who invented the first refractometer? Guinness, the beer people. <laughs> so they, so they, the first thing they invented was a thing to measure what's called bricks, which is sugar in the water, which is the same kind of idea, right? It's like stuff dissolved in the water. They wanted to standardize their beer production. They wanted to make sure that the quality was the same. So they wanted to measure how much sugar did they have in their liquid. And so they, they realized that the more junk that's in the water, the more the light refracts. The more pure it is, the less it refracts. And so they, they worked that out. And they first made a, a bricks refractometer. And then people studying the ocean were like, whoa, dude, we can take that, adapt that. So that refractometer, yes. they use that to measure the alcohol percentage? Uh, OK, so this refractometer is calibrated for salt. So this one will only do salt water. But a very, it's very similar, just a slightly different crystal. Um, so you can't use the same one to do sugar and salt, but you can use one calibrated for salt. It works exactly the same way, though. Pretty cool. It is kind of cool. It's science. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Okay. All right. Almost done. Almost, almost ready to break. Okay. Hold on. So we're, there we go. So almost finished this section. Okay. So my question for you is, why is the ocean salty? So we just said there's all this stuff in the in the ocean. How come it doesn't just Go out of the ocean. How, how come the salt doesn't sometimes come out? Okay, so the idea there, so the suggestion is that, so Finn's saying that that uh, the water is like the, the catch basin. Everything's going in the, the catch basin. Okay. It stirs up and it suspends. And... <laughs> okay. Maybe. Maybe. So what are some other ideas? Give me some other ideas. So, so Finn's like, it's going to stay the same because everything's going in there. I just told you that the ocean is 35 parts per thousand. It was, the average salinity was 35 parts per thousand 50 years ago. The average salinity was 35 parts per thousand 100 years ago. We weren't really measuring it 1,000 years ago, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was 35 parts per thousand 1,000 years ago. How is it saying so stable? Look for pH. <laughs> okay, let me, let me ask this question. Let me ask this question. So, so, so we have some rocks. We have some rocks, yeah? yeah? And some rocks are salty, right? If it rains on those rocks, you just, you, as you said, oh, the, the ocean is like the basin of everything, so it's going to catch everything, yeah? So aren't we going to be putting more salt in there? But you also add more water with the rain. Put the rain right, water. but the ocean isn't getting higher and higher and higher. I mean, well, it fluctuates, but, but, but on, from year to year, decade to decade, it's not, we're, not, we're not doubling the size of the ocean. This guy, Labasseur, one, one, one of the guys that's the father of modern chemistry, described the oceans, like you guys just were, were talking about, as the rinsings of the earth, right? So it rains, it, th this rock is going to get washed, this, this dirt's going to get washed, this salt's going to get washed, this whatever the hell, your underwear is going to get washed. Increasingly, our microplastics are going to get washed into the ocean, right? There's all this stuff all going down. Okay, cool. And so, and so he thought, like some of you guys said, oh, it's salty because this stuff is going in there. Um, and then we have things like weathering of stuff. Um, and then we also have things like volcanoes that are exploding and throwing up magma 
uh, 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 silicon, whatever, quartz, different things up into the air. So we're, we're also adding things into the air, into the ocean from, from down deep in the ocean. So we're adding more constituents. So we could be adding constituents from the erosion of, of exposed material. We can have stuff from down deep in the ocean come up and be adding to the material in the oceans. So still asking, but why, why does the salinity not change that much? To an extent, some of that happens, but there's a big thing you guys are forgetting or ignoring. Yes! Booyah! Life! Life is going on, right? All these things, these nutrients, these salts, who uses that stuff mostly? The living things use that. So they're sucking this stuff up. They're utilizing this in their life, in their physiology, in their life cycles, and all this kind of stuff. So um, we have all this stuff going on, and we have this so-called steady state hypothesis to explain why the salinity doesn't vary massively. So that's saying that these salts and these, these dissolved substances are removed from seawater roughly in the same proportion that they're being delivered. Not exactly, like, like a volcano go off, maybe this area is a little bit saltier for a little teeny bit. But by and large, at the scale of the planet, we, we seem to be in some type of, of steady state equilibrium, where the junk we add into the ocean roughly matches, or, or pretty damn close to exactly matches, the stuff that comes out. And the big mediator of that is life. So life on our planet Earth acts as this uh, sort of stabilizing mechanism, right? Kind of holding us in this steady state. But one example is the salinity of the world's ocean. So this is super cool. Check this out. What is this? It's a map. I don't know what the hell it is. Let's look at it. The map is, the, this is a map of the bottom of the ocean. It's a generalized map, a bit of a generic map, but check it out. So um, what I'm showing you here, obviously the continents are the continents, but with the exception of the continents, this is the bottom of the ocean. Now check it out. We have, um, there's some terms that I'll define for you guys next time, but, but neuritic, which means near, the, near a continent, near, near land, and then oceanic, which means out in the, far from land. Okay. Those terms will come next. But these different colors, these different colors refer to the dominance of the, the substances in the sediment. So, uh, the, uh, so, so the, the dark orange, the, the burnt orange color here, that's, that's clays, stuff that eroded off of the hillsides, basically. Um, the uh, light orange, same kind of things, clays. The uh, abyssal just means down deep. Again, well, I'll define these terms next time, but I just want to end it on this. Uh, and then the, the light grayish blue, awesome terms. Check this out, calcareous ooze. I get to say the word, like calcareous ooze, the term calcareous ooze in this class. How awesome is that? So calcareous ooze, and then the green stuff is silicaceous ooze. You should, you should rock that on your next Scrabble thing or whatever for Christmas time or whatever. Okay, so calcareous ooze, cal calcium, calcium carbonate, this is stuff like coral, okay? So this would be things that uh, uh, living critters that have made a shell, a skeleton, made out of calcium carbonate. And so that would be things like foraminifera, something you don't know about. We'll, we'll touch on it next time. But a little, little phytoplankton, little microscopic dude. Pteropods. Pteropods, epic. They're snails that fly. Instead of using their foot to crawl along, their, their, their foot has been modified, and they use them as a wing. So they fly through the ocean. Awesome. By the way, all these things, Aliens, uh, The Abyss, all these movies, science fiction movies, most of where those guys get their ideas is they look at mid-ocean, deep ocean. They get all their ideas for the Aliens movies. All that stuff is just copied from what goes on in the ocean. So, you know, flying snails, pff, totally we got those. Um, and then on the silicaceous ooze, these are critters, again, phytoplankton, well, actually pteropods, not phytoplankton, but, 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 but these planktonic critters, that make their shells out of glass, out of silicon dioxide, out of, out of basically the same thing as our windows. And so in this case, we have a diatom, which makes like two petri dishes together, two valves, and then radiolarians, which make like sort of like a Death Star-like thing with spikes. And so 
Okay, so those are the different constitu dominant constituents in these sediments, and check it out. Is it totally random? Are these constituents totally random across the, ocean, the bo bottom of the oceans of the world? No. No, why? Why do you think we have these patterns of concentrations of, of certain substances in one point, other substances in another point? Currents. There you go, currents. So the water is moving around in a consistent behavior. We'll talk about this next time. But it's moving around consistently. And in some cases, it's bringing oceanic water close to the coast. So maybe that's not good for, for life. In other cases, it's sucking this nutrient-rich river water farther out to sea and allowing these critters to bloom and grow. So when they die, when, when these critters all die, when they're alive, they're like, dude, I'm floating, I kick ass, right? But when they die, they're like, oh, I died. And then, and then their substances, their shells, are denser than the water. Maybe not massively, so it might take several weeks to float down to the bottom of the ocean, or maybe even longer, but they will eventually sink. And so over the millennia, you get this buildup of glass or chalk or whatever it is at the bottom of the ocean. And so one, that's cool for biological processes, but that's the process that cr helps create the stable state of salinity, right? We're sucking these materials out as life uses them.